uh, why don't you give us sort of an update? Uh, tell us, you know, uh, where you've been, what you've seen, and where we're going. The reason why I wrote the book is because um, when you when you go and you serve in government, and I don't know how many of you have had a chance to do it, it's usually a pretty intense experience, a steep learning curve. You learn the ways of government, you learn how to get things done, but then when you leave, there's not a natural transition of that information. You know, whether you're governor or, or president or cabinet secretary, uh, when you leave office, that's pretty much the end of your involvement. And so I had spent more than three years really learning about the VA, learning its unique abilities and capabilities, but I think more importantly, learning a formula for how to begin to start fixing some of the problems. And then it ended and there was no place to share that information. So the book for me was really my continued commitment to try to improve this system, to try to make the places that served your dad and my dad, who also passed away last year as a veteran, um, you know, really honor their service and what they gave to the country. And I believe that if there's any healthcare system in the country that really should be giving the best care possible, it should be to our veterans. Um, and uh, secondly, I felt a real obligation to talk about what public service was like and what it's become. And, and you know, um, I think that it's ironic right now, you know, you guys are sitting here, but you could be at home watching TV, watching the, the uh, impeachment hearings. But, you know, this is, this is a lot about um, what now the whole country is seeing, the dysfunction that exists in Washington, the partisan divisions, and what that is like if you are working in government, trying to improve services for the citizens of the country in this type of environment and how difficult that's become. And um, I wanted my book not to be so much a political statement, because I actually worked hard to try to stay away from partisan politics, but I just wanted to lay out the facts and the stories so that people could see. And, and um, I think in many ways the impeachment hearing is doing that. People are having a chance to see a set of facts and then watching how partisan our government has become in interpreting a set of facts. It's almost like two different worlds. And so um, just imagine trying to serve in public service, trying to get things done that you believe in, in that type of environment. Well, and, and trying to get things done is sort of understanding. Uh, from what we saw, uh, and from what's kind of, you know, highlighted in the book, you got so much done in so short of uh, amount of time. Now, I knew David before he uh, joined the government. He was uh, a lead, one of the top leaders in the hospital sector for many years. He was an entrepreneur. He was in, he had his own company or investments in companies and an investor. And so Dave is very special. And so when he joined uh, the government, there was hope. You know, I personally had hoped that if anyone could turn around or improve the system, which took care of my father and millions of other folks, it would be you. And it also provided sort of a this test bed, right, to really implement new technologies, which sort of um, are the holy grip, right, the way we can really get to a better system, um, mm -hmm. better care of, our, of everyone, including the veterans. So tell us, you know, when you first came to the government, you yeah. know, the opportunities and the challenges. Yeah. Well, I, I think I have somewhat of an interesting vantage point in having worked in both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, obviously, it's a don't need to say that these are very different types of leadership styles and different administrations. But um, when I entered the Obama administration, um, I was actually contacted by President Obama in 2014 when the VA wait time crisis was happening. And some of you may remember, I was a citizen, probably just like everybody else in this room, reading about it or watching it on TV where the allegation was, was that there were 
dozens of veterans dying because they couldn't get access to health care. And that, of course, was very upsetting. It led to the resignation of the current secretary and the undersecretary, which is the position that runs the VA health care system. And uh, that's when the White House called me. And um, I had a 12-month period where I went through vetting. Um, vetting, of course, which is a now a foreign concept, because we don't vet the same way in this administration. But it used to be that, that, um, that it was a very extensive process, and so it took about 12 months for me to get through vetting. And so I sat there on the sidelines just watching as the VA um, dealt with this issue of the wait time crisis, but I didn't really see a solution being proposed. There wasn't a lot of progress. So by the time that I entered the administration in July of 2015, um, the Obama administration had already been in office six and a half years. So there was a very set way of doing things. It was a very well-oiled administration. You knew exactly who to go to when you had a question at the White House. You knew how to present the information, which was very data heavy. You would present briefs and um, the White House would study it and then give you questions back and then you probably had two or three more rounds before you would ultimately hear a policy decision on the White House. Um, but when I entered in July 15, I was given the gift of having a crisis. And a crisis in government is one of the few opportunities that allows you to go fast and to say, look, um, I know I'm going to break some molds here. I know some people are going to be upset with it, but we do have a crisis. People are dying, and we need to fix this. So, so um, I, I went in. Uh, you know, the the normal advice that you would probably give a new CEO of a company is take your time, spend about three to six months, get to know the culture, understand the people, understand what works and what didn't. When I entered government, I knew right away I wouldn't have that time that I needed to uh, implement a plan right away because people's lives were at stake. And so uh, I went in with a um, fix for the wait time issue. Um, one of the secret plans was to uh, bring with me Dr. Puna Maleg, who's in the, front, uh, uh, in the front row here, who was your former commissioner of health of the state of New Jersey. But uh, what most people didn't know that I knew is, is that on weekends, Dr. Leg would spend her time at the VA in New Jersey uh, taking care of patients, and she had that passion for, for veterans as well. So she came and joined me, and we implemented a plan that um, uh, had an immediate impact on the wait time crisis. And the way that we did that is, is that um, I called a national stand-down, which is a military term, where in the military, if you have a stand down, you stop, you stop everything you're doing and you focus on a single objective. So in a traditional warfare, you might say, we're going to take that hill and everyone's going to focus on it until we get that objective. So the stand down that I called for was to take care of every veteran in the country that was waiting for care who had an urgent medical problem. It turned out there were 57,000 veterans or the urgent medical problems that were waiting more than 30 days for care, which was absolutely unacceptable. <laughs> so on our first stand down, which was probably um, uh, one of the first weekends that I joined the VA, we saw 56,000 of those 57,000 patients. So by Monday morning, there were less than a thousand veterans across the country waiting for urgent care. And once we did that, then we worked hard to implement same day access or same-day services for every veteran across the country so that they never end up having to wait more than 30 days for care. They could be seen if they had an urgent medical problem that day at a VA. And then December of 2016, I was able to tell President Obama that we had successfully implemented same-day services in every VA medical center in the country, no exceptions. Uh, so that we would never have to worry about veterans with urgent medical care waiting. And finally, we ended up publishing publicly all of our wait times, so that today the VA is still the only healthcare system I know of in the entire country that publicly publishes its wait times. So everybody could go to a website today, 
is exactly what those wait times are at any VA medical center in the country. And I believe that's the only way you can be truly transparent and accountable for the care that you deliver to be, you know, to publicly post your, your, your results. Um, we ended up last year publishing a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that shows that VA wait times are now better than you would find in the private sector. So that, for example, and we showed that from the time that uh, we, um, Dr. Legg and I, started working on this in 2015, that wait times in the VA decreased significantly across the country where the private sector has not improved access to care or has not improved wait times. So, so, so I think going back to your original question, um, the experience when I was in the Obama administration was it was um, the the real emphasis for moving and getting things done was a crisis. Once that crisis ended, um, and I uh, now the Trump administration came in, it was a very different environment. That sort of rigidity or or even a definition of process about how to get things done and the analytic style of President Obama uh, was completely gone. And President Trump uh, really didn't put clear processes in place. So um, ironically, to me, that was also a gift because I was the only member of the cabinet who had been in government. I knew my job already. I did, wasn't just learning my job. I knew exactly where the problems were, and I knew where we were going too slow in the Obama administration because of that analytic style. So I would just walk into the president's office, the Oval Office, and I'd say, Mr. President, here's what I want to do. And he would say, well, is it good for veterans? I'd say, yes, Mr. President. He'd say, so let's do it. And we just got an amazing amount done that I know would have been a more methodical, slower process under President Obama. So that first year I was secretary, we got 11 major bills through Congress, all with bipartisan support. The president was always happy to have a ceremony to sign something. <laughs> That's what he likes to do. And, um, and uh, you know, we completely revised our appeals process. We put in a new GI bill. We got accountability bills for VA employees. We made choice a permanent part of our system. We expanded telehealth. We expanded mental health benefits. Uh, we gave access to those who were um, other than honorably discharged, which was important to do, which I had always been told you couldn't do. But, you know, the president was more than happy to support things that he thought were good for veterans. So, so very two very, very different styles, two very different sort of sets of circumstances, but in both sort of finding a way to get things done. And I'm glad you highlighted some of those things, because there's so many mm -hmm. um, examples in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and suicide is one of them, uh, which is a very big concern of yours. Absolutely. Uh, mental health. Right, right. Absolutely. It became, uh, you know, it, one, one of the jobs when you run a organization that has close to 400,000 employees and over $200 billion, the job of leadership very much becomes to create priority. Mm -hmm. um, and so I made it unambiguous that our single top clinical priority would be to reduce veteran suicide. With 20 veterans a day taking their life, um, you know, while veterans represent 11% um, 11, 11 of the American population today, uh, over 40% of all suicides in the country are veterans. Uh, so, um, you know, suicide is an American public health crisis. I want to be clear about that. But when it comes to veterans, it's particularly alarming. Um, and, um, and I really felt like we needed to address that. And, of course, the single highest rate of suicide, not the number, but the highest incidence of suicide is that one year when you transition out of the military, that those first 12 months. And so I felt like we could really do something about that. And it's one of the reasons why um, I worked so closely with the Department of Defense, because these organizations, while they both cared about the people that, you know, they served, they never really 
worked together before. So, so that's one of the things that I think is really important to do. Before we get to questions, I yeah. just wanted to uh, give the opportunity to give us an update on what's transpired since you left. I know in the book, I think you said some things after you left were finalized, and they did sort of change your, yeah. your leadership. Uh, but give us an update on everything else. Well, um, when I left, uh, and you maybe got a little sense of that if you haven't read the book, just, just from watching that short video, um, I left uh, pretty publicly talking about um, what was going on at the time politically in the administration. And um, there were a number of political appointees who felt that I was not moving quick enough to privatize the VA. Um, and, and, and by the way, that doesn't make them bad people. That, that, I believe, is a, much like you're seeing in Washington, there is a political ideology. There are some people, and you see them, some of them are running for president, who believe that government should be running all of health care. And there are others who believe that government has no role in running services, that government's role should be national defense and tax collection and things like that, but in the delivery of services, government shouldn't have a role. I, of course, um, as I think I've said a couple times, I'm not a political person, so I didn't have a political ideology. I'm a doctor, I'm a healthcare administrator. I came in to try to fix a broken system for veterans, and I believe that what was best for veterans was actually a hybrid system, one that where the government honored its responsibility and focused on things that uh, are directly related to a veteran service that the private sector just doesn't have the competence or expertise in, but that a government-run system can't answer all of the needs of a health care of 9 million veterans so that you need to work with the private sector. So I was trying to orchestrate a hybrid system between the public sector and the private sector, which is somewhat of a balance. And of course, as, as you know, being in the middle in Washington these days, advocating for sort of more moderate, you know, compromise positions is not a fun place to be uh, politically in Washington. It's actually easier if you belong to one of these political spectrums. I just wasn't willing to do that because I didn't think that was the right answer for veterans. So, um, so, so, so when I left, uh, I decided that um, I would not follow the unwritten rule, the unwritten rule being when you leave Washington, you should go quietly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign on to some of this political campaign. My whole goal going to Washington was to help veterans, and I didn't see how I could help veterans if I didn't tell people what I believed in. So I went out and I very publicly talked about this issue of privatization. And I talked about what I believe some of the political appointees in the administration were trying to do and why I thought they were misguided. And I tried to do it not in a personal attacking way or criticizing the president, but trying to stay on the substance of the issue. I think, Jim, that created some sunshine, a spotlight, on this issue of privatization. And Congress began to get involved in that issue. And I believe because of that, because of the oversight and the role of Congress, that that really did slow down the efforts towards privatization, which allowed many of the initiatives that I began to continue to work in the VA. So fortunately, the electronic record system, which I had started that project to do this with the Department of Defense for the suicide issue, quite frankly, was implemented and is continuing to roll out. Many of the mental health benefits that we had started continued to roll out. The work with the private sector, now called the Mission Act, got finalized and has continued to roll out. And so I think that there has been continued progress in reforming the system. Uh, I think that there are a lot of things that still need to be done. Um, and I'm very, very interested to see how in this election campaign uh, people articulate what their vision is for the VA system. I don't think that 
um, it's been clear enough the differences in candidates and what they would do. So I think you men mentioned this, but when it comes to healthcare, yes, there are many more challenges with the VA. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's also some benefits versus the private mm -hmm. sector. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, I think I think that the I should probably start by saying, um, you know, I was a CEO of a New Jersey hospital 45 minutes away from here. Um, with never any thought of going to the VA. I was pretty happy running private hospitals. And then, uh, you know, when I got the call that from the White House, um, I just didn't feel I could say no, that if your country needs you, um, that how could you say no? So, but I went really with a pretty open mind. And I was just reading the newspaper, seeing how broken the VA is. And I thought, look, if I go to the VA and I see that this system is not working and it's so broken, I may just simply advocate, let's close it. Let's, let's transition the VA fully into the private sector. Why would I want to be there to oversee a broken system that's not helping veterans? So I came in with a very open mind about what I would find. And frankly, uh, when I went through my confirmation process, I said that. I said, look, you know, I can't really tell you what I'm going to do until I get there, but I can tell you uh, I'm going to recommend what I think is best for veterans. One of the very first things I did when I got to the VA, much like Dr. Legg was doing, I put on my white coat and I started seeing patients because that's what I've always done as a hospital CEO. It helps me understand what I'm doing as a, as a leader. And my very first patient I saw, I was seeing patients in the Manhattan VA on, 20, on 23rd Street. The very first patient I saw was a, was a young man who, uh, about 23, 24 years old, who came to see me. And I couldn't figure out why he was there. I've been a doctor a long time. And I know when patients are sick, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with this guy. So I finally said to him, I don't see that many 23, 24 year olds who can't tell me why they're, why, why they're here. What's going on? Why are you really here? And he said, all right, look, I'll tell you. Uh, I got discharged from the army about six months ago and I'm lost and I've been living in Central Park ever since then. I'm homeless. And, you know, I used to have somebody who told me what to do every day and they gave me three meals a day and told me where to sleep. And now, like, I'm lost. And so if I were, private doctor in my old hospital, I would have said, boy, I feel really bad for you, you know, maybe I'll, you know, maybe you should go talk to a social, ser social service agency. I'm not really sure what I would have said, but in the VA, I know exactly what to do because that's our mission and we help homeless veterans find homes. So we got them that day connected, we got them temporary shelter, then permanent shelter, we found them a job, we got them back on track and it's exactly what needed to be done. And I began to understand that um, not only was this system fixable, but it was doing things for veterans that frankly, if we just gave them vouchers and said, we're gonna pay for your care at Morristown or Hackensack or other places, there'd be a lot of people worse off. So that really convinced me that this was a system worth saving. The real superpower of the VA, getting back to this question, I believe, is the ability to um, deliver health care without the constraints of our reimbursement system. As a hospital CEO in the private sector, when I was the CEO of Marstown, uh, there were lots of things I wanted to do, but I just couldn't do them because we weren't getting paid for them. I couldn't house all of the, not that there's that many homeless people in Marstown, but there actually are some 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 lower socioeconomic people in, in, in Morristown. I couldn't help them all because we didn't have a reimbursement system that supported that. In the VA, Congress gave us our money, two years ahead of time, by the way, and gave us a pot of money and said, go out and do what's right for veterans. And that means if, if it's spending it on housing, transportation, medications, food, um, you know, mental health care, physical health care, we got to do what, what the right thing was. So you got to focus today on what's so popular in health care called the social, the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's pretty powerful stuff. And um, 
I always thought that, you know, I'd enter a VA, the smart private sector CEO, showing them how to do so many great things using private management techniques right. in government. But in actuality, I learned much more in government that I think the private sector can benefit from. Well, speaking of you know, access, mm -hmm. is, you know, there's a discussion nationally about Medicare expansion mm -hmm. and how that might affect veterans or the VA. Mm -hmm. is, how, how do you answer that? Well, um, there, there, there are several things about the healthcare debate right now. Um, when you talk about access, um, whether, whether you call it Obamacare or whether you have a different name for another health care reform proposal, I think our objective should be that all Americans should have access to health care. Unfortunately, unfortunately um, we still have a large, large number of uninsured people. It's actually gone up rather than gone down. We still have many people that while they have some health care insurance, um, they do not get the health care they need because of the economic implications of using their insurance, whether it's high deductibles or surprise medical bills. And so the economics of the way that we finance health care still is not helping us achieve what I think our country's objective should be. So. So I am glad to see this be one of the top issues in our political debates because, frankly, we need new ideas. But when it comes specifically to veterans, um, I believe that, um, and this is a little bit more technical, and I don't know if the, if the person who wrote the question want, wanted this type of answer, but I'd be glad to talk to them separately. Um, I believe we have it wrong when it comes to VA healthcare and Medicare. I don't believe that they should be necessarily completely separate systems, which they are. So I was advocating for something that is called Medicare subvention. Medicare subvention would mean that a veteran, that the VA could accept Medicare as a payment. Today, if you have Medicare and you're a veteran and you go to a VA hospital, the VA hospital cannot utilize your Medicare benefit. And I believe that's a wrong system. I believe that in order to get our system fixed, that VA should be able to bill for Medicare, just like a private hospital would bill a veteran for Medicare. And that would create a system that would allow our VA hospitals to be financed differently and to function differently. The reason why I was shot down for that, I believe it was a the state of the current administration not to listen to me on this one, okay? Uh, the reason is, is because OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, their primary concern was to keep the Medicare uh, trust fund in a fiscally solvent position. It was, at the time that I was there, they were going to get into trouble by 2029 and they didn't want to shorten that. And if we allow the VA to be able to bill Medicare, in other words, let these systems work interchangeably, uh, it would potentially shorten the life of the Medicare trust fund. So that's a, that's a reasonable concern for OMB. I understood that. I just felt like, like that we, we missed an opportunity to begin to start rationalizing our healthcare system. And um, I believe someday that will once again be rethought of. There's startups out here and you're like entrepreneurs. Yes, right. They want to know how they can work with the uh, VA. Yeah. As an entrepreneur yourself, as someone who's led the VA, um, are we doing enough to engage entrepreneurs and engage, engage open innovation? Uh, any advice for the entrepreneurs in the crowd? Uh, well, I'll try to keep it short, but again, be glad to talk to people further about this type of thing. Uh, the federal government is not a place I recommend startups spend a lot of time. It, it, is, it is not a quick procurement process. It is not an intuitive process. And I've seen many startups uh, with the right intentions um, not be able to outlast the federal government bureaucracy. So, so if you do it, you have to do it in a deliberate way. You have to know what you're doing. And I would suggest partnering 
with companies that know what they're doing in order to do that. Um, having said that, the government needs that type of innovation and um, new thinking in order to solve many of its problems. And uh, I created several mechanisms in order to try to encourage innovation. I created in the health administration something called the Center for Compassionate Innovation, where we would short track ideas that frankly focused on serious issues that veterans were suffering from. Suicide and PTSD certainly did some examples of that. Um, and we also created a Center for Strategic Partnerships so that companies could work with the VA outside of a, a traditional procurement process. So there are some mechanisms to do it. It still is very, very slow down. Okay. What can we learn from the reimbursement model used by the VA? And maybe it'll apply to uh, value-based care and risk-based contracting in the private sector. Well, first of all, you know, if I took the first part of the question, uh, what can we learn about reimbursement, and I stopped it there, I would say the single biggest lesson, I believe, is, is that behavioral health care and physical health care should not be separate health care systems. In our private sector, as you know, you have traditional managed care, and then you have behavioral managed care, and the two, frankly, work against the patient's interest. In the VA, because we don't have that, Behavioral health care is often delivered in the setting of primary care. It's an integrated approach. I think it's far more effective. There's just not a mechanism to pay for that in the private sector. But I believe we have to work towards a reintegration of our payment systems. The issue about what can you learn from in value-based contracting from the VA is not very much. And the reason is Congress has legislated the VA is only allowed to pay in a fee-for-service system on a Medicare fee schedule. Now, if you think about that, that is what our healthcare system looked like in the 80s, okay? So again, what I worked very hard with Congress to do is to try to get them to allow us to do value-based contracting and to do more shifting of risk to the private sector. And the furthest that they went, it is now part of the Mission Act, is to create a center for payment innovation in VA where we could test some pilots. I haven't seen that yet happen, but there is a mechanism that VA can start to experiment with payment reform. Great. And how did you increase telehealth adoption among those areas that are not so tech savvy? So um, v VA, VA, because of its mission, which is to deliver healthcare anywhere in the country a veteran is, even if we don't have facilities or doctors, by definition, needed to find a way to deliver care to veterans, who by the way, often like to live in rural areas, particularly those who had been in tough combat situations. They prefer not being in large crowds or, or you know, taking subways to work. So about 40% of veterans live outside of traditional metropolitan areas. So VA has always used technology like telehealth uh, in a more advanced way than you have seen in the private sector. Having said that, when I got to VA and I wanted to use telehealth more, I came across the strangest thing. And I'll just tell this story. I know this violates the, the lightning <laughs> rounds, but I, think it's a, but I think it's an interesting story. Um, the VA, even though it had federal supremacy, which meant that since I led a federal agency, I could go above state law. When I went to go above state law for telehealth, and what I wanted to do, which made sense, is I wanted to say, you could, I didn't want to follow state licensing for telehealth. So I wanted any doctor, a doctor in New Jersey, who had extra time to be able to help a veteran in Montana. But you can't do that in the VA because the VA was adhering to state licensing. So the, so the doctor in New Jersey would have to have a state relationship in Montana to help. And I said, no, I'm, I run a federal agency. I'm going to declare that we can do telehealth anywhere in the country, just like the Department of Defense did. The only problem was, was that my lawyers 
were the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice said, I don't think so. That's not that important to us. And so I tried, like a good team player, to get this resolved. I tried to get internal White House meetings and try to sit down with Jeff Sessions at the time and try to say, look, you don't understand. This is important. We have to do this. They basically said, I don't care. And very frustrating. So what I did was I asked the president whether he would mind if I came to see him one day and show him how I took care of patients. I happened to, I told you, I saw patients on 23rd Street in New York City in person, but I also happened to take care of patients in Grants Pass, Oregon, a very rural part of Oregon that lost their primary care doctor. So I said, I'll be the primary care doctor. I would see them from my office in Washington using telehealth. So I brought my telehealth equipment to the White House. Mm -hmm. Dr. Light was with me that day, right? Remember that? And we brought, we brought uh, the telehealth equipment to the West Wing, and uh, I started to see my patients in Grand Pass, Oregon, and I showed the president. And, you know, I knew he would like it, because it was like, <laughs> you know, high tech and cool. So he said, wow, this is really great. And I said, yeah, it's really great. But, you know, Mr. President, I can't do this everywhere. I had to get licensed in Oregon. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, because I can't get the Department of Justice to support me in this. He said, all right, let me see if I can help. And uh, we got that resolved in the week. <laughs> so, and, and now, a VA doctor can see patients anywhere in the country, anytime, uh, using federal supremacy. Share with us just one thing that you're optimistic about as far as, let's say, technology and health and the potential benefits down the road. You know, look, I'm very excited about genomics and personalized medicine. I think uh, when people talk about the 30 to 40 percent waste in our system in healthcare, um, I, I think there is 30 to 40 percent waste, but I don't think it's the reasons why most people are saying. I think the reason is we are really terrible at diagnosing what's wrong with patients and then figuring out how to treat them. And I know that's simple stuff, but but with precision personalized medicine, I hope we can actually get to the point that we know what's wrong with the patient and then figure out which therapies are gonna work for it. Now that's aspirational from where we are, but I believe there's tremendous promise. In a very similar way on those two issues, I also am excited about artificial intelligence because um, the fact that today, any of us who are sick will go to a doctor and we're still relying on, did they read that journal? Were they paying attention when they read it? You know, how could possibly anybody retain the amount of information that's out there right now? Um, the, this is not what a doctor should be doing. A doctor should be focusing on the human elements of an interaction with somebody who needs help. And we should be using machines to figure out how to tap into this unbelievable scientific body of knowledge. And I, you know, nothing happens quickly in healthcare. So I think both with genomics and with artificial intelligence, 10 or 15 years from now, we'll be seeing a very, very different way that healthcare is delivered. Um, and it will be incremental along the way, but, but that's my hope for the future. I'll just end with this, uh, David. Uh, the other night, I was watching PBS, mm -hmm. and I watched a, a show called The American Experience. I was just channel surfing, I was going to watch Mrs. Basil, and, and I just decided mm -hmm. not to. Yeah, second season's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I yeah. learned about a gentleman called Harvey Wiley, who at the turn of the century, was an advocate for you know, safe food, because our food was poisoned in canned goods, even given to the military. That's, they were giving rancid meat in cans. And mm. those companies, big companies taking advantage mm. of, 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 of the military and people in general. And this guy is in government no longer than you, two decades. And he changed the course of history. And uh, it made our food much safer mm. then and of course today. And so I thought, when I, when I watched it, I thought of you, I said, you know, right now, this is history. I mean, you, you did so much in such a short period of time that we can all, not just veterans, but the country can be really thankful for your 
advocacy, for your efforts, for your innovation uh, in such a large uh, institution. So I want to thank you on behalf of, of everyone here, and you know, my dad and, and veterans uh, specifically, uh, for your help. And uh, we, we only hope that perhaps one day you can get back in there uh, and, and maybe make it even a bigger difference in the future. So one thing. One thing. First of all, I mean, I mean, I think what what's um, nice about your story as your as your ending it is um, knowing that there are just such tremendous dedicated people who work in government, and um, you know, I didn't know what to expect when I when I went into VA. I thought, you know, these are going to be nine to five people. You know, maybe they're not going to be at the top of their game. And while in every organization you always have the outliers, you know, the majority of these people were as dedicated, if not more, than people that I've worked with in the private sector. Um, very, very focused on the mission. In the VA, 40% of the employees themselves are veterans and they're there to serve, you know, their, their brothers and sisters. And, um, and so we have incredible people who work in the organization. Part of what my concern about the environment that we see today is, is that whether people are going to continue to want to enter this environment, you know, will people want to look towards government as a place to spend their careers? And are we going to continue to see what we're seeing now is a brain drain of people who say, you know, this is this is not the environment I want to serve in. And if that happens, if we allow public service to be degraded like that, um, I think we're all going to suffer because we need people figuring out that there's rancid meat and putting in standards. Um, and the environment today that we see public servants being publicly attacked um, is just unacceptable, you know. And um, you know, I wish that there was more of a public outcry against that because, you know, you see the real issues like coronavirus, you know, we need people who are going to be focused on it. That's not a Democratic or Republican issue. That's something that, frankly, could, you know, destroy all of our lives. So, um, so I think it's important that, that we remember that and, um, you know, how we get back to a place of normality, that's not quite as clear. Well, thank you again for your service. Sure.